Well, good evening, Hops fans. Welcome to Hops SMS workshop number 21. We've come of age today. We've got the key to the door. Never been 21 before. Do say hello in the comments. Let us know what your name is, what organisation you're watching from, and I'll be sure to say hello to you. You can be immortalised on the recording of this Hops SMS workshop. We'll just give everyone plenty of time to join in. And we'll make a start. Yes, hello, welcome to Hops SMS Workshop number 21 on the overall document. It's a bit like Star Wars, we're 21 episodes in and now we're going to have episode 1, which you thought we might have had at the start. But there is logic to why we're having it now. quite a lot of the other SMS documents that we have been talking about over the last year. Let's say some hellos. Hello to Wayne Dixon watching from the Weirdale Railway. Hello Neil Coles. Stuart Pay is watching. I wonder if that's Stuart Pay and Johnny Pay from the uh, Spa Valley Railway. Leslie Lee is watching. Hello. Hello Paul Ash from the Moores Valley Railway. John Minnell. Tom Bailey from Etchell's Wood, thank you very much. According to this, and I have never seen Facebook do this before, it's your five follower anniversary, Tom, so well done. Hello, Ruth from the Weirdale Railway, Adam Williams from the Dean Forest. Everyone's tuning in this evening, thank you very much, it's magnificent. Just make sure we give everyone plenty of time to join in, and then we'll make a start. It's two minutes past seven now. Here in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, 5am in Queensland, Australia, 5.30 in South Australia, 6am in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. The sun never sets on railways that are supported by hops, we're pleased to say. I wonder if we will have anyone from Australia watching us on this hops SMS workshop. Hello to James West from the Royal Deeside, Preserva Royal Deeside Railway Preservation Society. Hello, Carl Hellings, Paul Milnes from the Cholsey and Wallingford. Katie from Epping Onga, thank you very much for joining in. Josh Armstrong from the Weirdale Railway. Hello, right, thank you very much. Gosh, that's uh, magnificent, the number of people that are tuned in. I'm sure you know how this works. We'll just go through a quick introduction and then we'll start on the main business of the evening. So let's see what we've got lined up in the Hops SMS workshop this evening. There's our programme for 2021. As you can see, we're on the last one. We did actually have more workshops than that because we squeezed some extra ones in, but this will be the last Hops Live workshop for 2021. Uh, as I have advertised elsewhere, we will continue the programme in 2022 because I know you've all enjoyed it so much. So there's the first of the uh, 2022 Hops workshop, starting on the 18th of January, so you get a bit of a break, and then we'll continue with this six-weekly uh, frequency of SMS workshops starting on the 18th of January with competence for duty officers, moving on to user works, level crossings, rule books and structures, management of change, and then after that to be continued based on the feedback that you give and what other subjects and topics that you like uh, that you would like to see covered. So that's the programme for next year. Don't forget the Hops Winter Workshop Roadshow takes place in January, February and March next year. There's one, two, three, four, five, six locations at which the Clipart helicopter will be landing at the Welsh Pool and Clan Fair Railway, Bressingham Steam and Gardens, the West Somerset Railway at Bishop's Lydiard, Tum, uh, Tunbridge Wells, Spa Valley Railway, the Crouch Tramway in Derbyshire and Beamish Museum in County Durham. Completely open hops workshops to anyone that wants to attend, whether you're already a hops user, whether you're just starting out, or whether you've got no idea what hops is and you'd like to find out more. This is the ideal time to come and find out, not just to hear it from me, but to hear it from other admins uh, who use it themselves. Don't forget that it is necessary to register if you want to attend the hops workshop. Send an email to me or Alan, uh, admin at heritageops.org.uk. We'll do fine uh, and we'll book you on. Uh, Top of the Hops came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, the house newsletter for Hops. If you haven't received it, then you can ask your Hops admin to allocate you the permission to receive updates, or which I can't remember what number it is off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Uh, somebody in the comments can let me know the receive updates uh, permission, and then you'll receive it directly as long as, uh, sorry, as well as 
uh, other email updates on the progress of HOPS and significant updates. Don't forget, HOPS is offering an assessor course in December over two half days on the 14th and 16th of December, run by John Arnold from the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. It is an official assessor course. Uh, do I, it's a level three, understanding the principles and practices of assessing. If you'd like more information about that, please email in and I will send it to you. Uh, rules of the workshop. Sorry if you've heard these a million times before, but I'll go over them very quickly. Number one rule, please join in. Please do join in. Please make comments and questions, especially if you disagree with what's being said. And we've definitely had some disagreements in the uh, HOPS SMS workshops, and that's good. That's a good thing, because one size does not necessarily always fit all. There will be different people with different views. All I'm telling you in the workshops is my view. I don't have any authority to say that it is the best or it's the one that you must do. Uh, it is just a view of what I consider to be the best practices that I've come across over working with many of you uh, over the years. Uh, do share with others. If you've got good experience of the subject matter being discussed, do put your experience and your comments in the comments so that other people can read them. And if you don't have that experience, then do learn from others. Use this as an opportunity to both send and receive some best practice. The videos will be on Facebook pretty permanently and on YouTube within a few days after the uh, broadcast on Facebook now. Purpose of the HOPS SMS workshops is to construct a best practice set of SMS templates, which is exactly what we have been doing to save us all a bit of time, because otherwise we're all duplicating that thought process and that research and development and coming up with roughly the same answer every time. To save us all a bit of cost, because even if it is volunteers doing that work, volunteers are not free, and there is a cost to having volunteers uh, coming up with SMS policies. And lastly, to share best practice and to give us all the opportunity to demonstrate, if asked, that we are taking part in best practices, we are seeing what other railways are doing, and we are contributing what we know into the, uh, into the melting pot. And thank you very much, incidentally, for those of you that routinely do send in your SMS document for the subject that we're going to discuss in the workshop. It really does help. And in fact, uh, this SMS workshop in particular, where we're going to discuss the overall document, is um, definitely a Frankenstein of lots of different railways SMSs, which I hope I've gone through and made all you know seamlessly stitched together. I'm sure you might find the odd little uh, sentence that doesn't make sense here and there, but I'm really pleased at how everyone is contributing into this. It really is a good example of how to work together um, and earn points for doing so. As I've said, we are definitely not saying that this is what you must do. We are not saying that this is what you must do, we're just saying this is one example of a best practice that we found, and we're also not saying that this is guaranteed to be suitable for every undertaking. Every undertaking is slightly different, different gauges, different sizes, different parts of the country, uh, different risks, steam and diesel and heights and tunnels and level crossings and all those different things that were all very different. Um, you must make sure that what you take out of the templates is appropriate. And you can either take the whole template and then edit it to how you like, or you can copy and paste the paragraphs that you want, or you can do whatever you like with the templates uh, if you have access to them. The Word document templates are made available to Advanced HOPS member railways. If you're not an Advanced HOPS member railway, you're certainly welcome to frantically type out what's on the screen, but I'm afraid we do have to pay the bills somehow. So the Word document templates are only available to Advanced HOPS railways. Right, let's get on with the business of the day then and start talking about SMSs, safety management system overall documents. And one thing I would like to revisit here that we have talked about before is the difference between the safety management system with capital letters and the safety management system with small letters. Or the safety management system as a title and the system for managing safety as a whole. And every railway draws the line between these two things in a different place. And sometimes it just comes down to uh, what's in one document and what's in another. And it doesn't actually matter which document something is written down in, as long as it is written down somewhere. Some railways have one safety management system document that is hundreds and hundreds of pages long and very few supporting documents. Some railways have a small overall document, which is what we're going to discuss today, and loads and loads of supporting policies. And all those supporting policies are part of the system for managing safety, they're all there for a reason, they're all mitigating some risk or another, and you might or might not consider them to be part of the capital letters safety management system. 
We don't need to get too hung up in where the distinction lies. The important thing is that everything has to be written down somewhere, and whether you choose to put in a small number of extremely large documents or a large number of extremely small documents is completely up to you. But I always work on the basis of a large number of quite small documents. So the overall document, I always call it the overall document, to make clear that it is the SMS is not solely this overall document. The SMS includes all of those supporting documents and policies that mitigate risks and are referred to in the overall document. They're all part of the SMS, and that's why I always call the overall document the overall document, rather than calling the overall document the SMS. Oh, here's a little pictogram that I made. You can choose as to whether you're right over at the left-hand side of the picture where you put more in the overall document and less in the sub-documents. That's a big red and a small blue. Or whether you're over the right-hand side of the uh, diagram and you put more in the sub-documents and less in the overall documents. And that's definitely where I am over towards that side of the picture. So let's just have a little bit uh, of an example of where we think the SMS overall document might fit in. Here's the SMS overall document at the top of what's going to become a tree structure, and I think it is uh, relevant and, and helpful that we do think of it as a tree structure rather than a, a net or a circle or something like that. And the SMS document is a pointer document, it's a guidance, a guiding document that tells you where to find things. Not the answer of how safety is managed in detail, but it says things like um, signalling maintenance will be managed in accordance with policy number whatever, or competence will be managed in accordance with policy number whatever else. It doesn't actually tell us the answers, it just tells us where to go to find that other document. I've started, and, and whenever I start thinking about an SMS, I tend to start and finish with the overall document. I start with the overall document, a great big brainstorm of everything I've got to include, and there's lots of you know, guidance out there in ROGs and uh, in the ORR and in other documents that you can find online about what should be in the SMS. I have my usual great big brainstorm that I always talk about, and anything that's more than a couple of paragraphs in the overall document gets immediately taken out of the overall document and put into a sub-document, and that's how I always end up with loads of sub-documents and quite a small pocket-sized um, overall document. So the overall document will sit at the top, and then underneath that, you might have four or five sort of headline documents, the safety policy statement, things like that. I just randomly picked uh, five subject headings that are sort of next level down from the overall document. And then just to expand one of those, competence could sub-expand into guards and footplates and duty officers and signalmen, and just to expand one of those, footplate could extend into a rules competence and a route competence and a traction competence. That's how I always imagine SMSs to be structured and each one of those boxes to be a document in its own right. Just to uh, uh, fully illustrate one line down that uh, tree of SMSs, there's my SMS overall document again. And uh, this time we're going to look at the specific example of competence. The SMS overall document might say something along the lines of everyone doing a safety critical role will be trained and assessed before carrying out work. It doesn't list who those safety critical roles are, and it doesn't say what the competence assessment criteria is going to be, and it doesn't say whether it's going to be a written exam or a verbal exam or an observation or a combination of all of them and how many training turns you have to do and all that stuff. It just says the headline that everything else has to comply with, everyone doing a safety critical role uh, will be trained and assessed before carrying out work. And it will probably also say in accordance with document number C1 if you're using my um, document numbering structure. So C1 will be the competence management document for the whole organisation. It will explain the way that competences and assessments will be managed. But again, not down to specific roles. This applies to the whole organisation. It will say things like um, how assessors are appointed and the fact that every assessment must result in a binary yes or no answer as to whether the person is competent and how feedback will be given and what to do if there's a dispute and, and, and all those sorts of things. And a sub-document for that will be the footplate one, which will have to comply with everything that's in the competence overall document, which will have to comply with everything that's in the SMS overall document, and will contain the specifics of competence and assessments for roles in the STEAM footplate department. So there'll be a one of that level document for the other departments as well. And then sub to that, there will be the competence assessment criteria for each um, competence uh, that is managed in the footplate department. So you can see how this sort of structure works. I don't think I need to go on and on about it for ages, but it is important that every document complies with the requirements of the one above it. 
Another reason why I feel it's useful to have these things as four separate documents is that it means if we want to have a review of footplate competence and maybe change what the lines of progression are or what the roles are or what the competence levels are or decide that you've got to do six fireman turns before you can train to be a driver and all those sorts of things, we only have to review the footplate document. We don't have to review the overall competence document. We don't have to review the guards document, the duty officers document, all those other things. We can just review the footplate document and it's likely that there will be people with the subject matter knowledge to comprehensively review that footplate document, like the footplate inspectors, for example. But they might not necessarily be the right people to review the guards' competence um, uh, documents or the um, signalman's competence documents. And so those are in separate documents and they're left alone. And it makes it a lot easier to manage and review and develop um, without everything sort of knocking into each other. Just another quick example before we move on, talking about maintenance. The SMS overall document might say safety critical infrastructure will be maintained and it might go as far as to say um, P-Way will be maintained in accordance with SMS P1, signalling will be maintained in accordance with SMS A1, whatever they all are. The permanent way document, SMS P1, will say that permanent way will be maintained in accordance with and it will list the... Um, uh, the, the document number that lists how basic visual inspection is carried out, how relays are carried out, how broken rails are dealt with, how all these different facets of managing permanent way infrastructure will be a range of documents. And I'm not saying you have to have 200 documents, one for stapling something to the notice board and one for making a cup of tea. Obviously, a lot of things can be combined together, but a lot of things... Um, also are best kept in documents of their own. So in my example, I said we'll have a document that's the process for how a basic visual inspection is conducted. And you can see that this, in the same way as the previous slide, means if we want to review the P-Way uh, infrastructure maintenance document without touching signalling or culverts or buildings or overhead gantry cranes or anything like that, it's one nice document that the right people can review without bumping into the other documents. Right, OK, I think I've done that to death now. Let's have a little quick word and see what the ORR have got to say about safety management systems. I think we all know this, but just to confirm, uh, the ORR says that the health and safety management system enables an organisation to meet its legal duty to identify, eliminate or reduce so far as reasonably practicable the risks that its activities create. That's the first thing in the SMS, sorry, in the ORR's document about SMSs that it says. And I've highlighted the word risks there. The SMS is a means of identifying, eliminating, and reducing risk as far as reasonably practicable. So we have to understand what risks our activities are creating in order that we can build an SMS um, to apply the mitigation to bring that risk down to an acceptable level. And that's why it's so important that whatever you take out of the SMS templates that you get out of hops or when you get an SMS for another railway and you say, oh, good, this has got lots of good stuff in, you can't just delete the title name on the top and put your own railway title name in and say, brilliant, there's our SMS. Because the risks in different organisations are very different, but we can all learn a lot from the risks that overlap. An SMS is more than a written policy and procedures. It is an organization's underpinning philosophy of how it safely delivers its business objectives through the effective use of resources. An organization's SMS should focus on ensuring that the physical, managerial, procedural and cultural elements of the organization are managed to deliver effective and efficient risk control. And we certainly see examples of, where, of railways where the SMS is more honored in the breach than in the observance. And... Apart from ticking a box to say that you've got an SMS, you're wasting your time if it is the case that the SMS is just something that lives in a drawer. And this also comes back to what I was saying about how you choose to divide up what you call the SMS. If you only call the overall document the SMS and everything else just sort of sloshes around and is uncontrolled and doesn't have numbers and doesn't fit into a structure, it's much less cohesive and it gains the SMS much less exposure um, amongst everybody that works on the railway. The SMS is not some scary document that everybody should be afraid of. The SMS is a document where if somebody's got a question, they should find the answer in the SMS. <laughs> how many driving turns do I have to do before I can become an assessor? Or uh, how do I protect such and such a job when it's going on and it's a red timetable day? Or whatever the answer is, 
if you're managing it effectively, it should be in the SMS somewhere. A definite quote that I have heard with my own ears from the ORR is if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And that goes for risk assessments and maintenance records and SMSs. The success of whatever processes, whatever process or system is in place hinges on the attitudes and behaviours of the people in the organisation, the culture. And it is really important. It can't be underlined enough. And if there are people in your organisation who will not embrace the attitudes and behaviour and a culture that you want them to for positive safety management, then they are not contributing positively to your organisation and you will probably be better off without them. Harsh though that may sound, especially in an environment I do recognise where, in inverted commas, we need all the volunteers we can get, well, perhaps some volunteers we don't necessarily need if they're not going to embrace this safety management culture. It really is more important than anybody's level of skill in how to paint things or maintain things or use a particular tool. Right, let's see what ROGS has got to say. You can find this on the legislation.gov.uk website. I'm pretty sure it's Schedule 1 of ROGS 2006. The safety management system shall describe the distribution of responsibilities within the operation for the safety management system. Show how control of the safety management system show how control of the safety management system by the management on different levels is secured, show how persons carrying out work or voluntary work directly in relation to the operation and their representatives on all levels are involved with the safety management system, and show how continuous improvement of the safety management system is ensured. That's what ROG says. It does say a lot more than that, but they're the sort of headline things in part one of schedule one uh, of ROGS 2006. Interestingly, in Part C there, it says show how persons carrying out work or voluntary work, obviously very relevant to our sector. And I would suggest that in your SMS, you do not make any distinction between employees and volunteers and just call them all staff. There really should be no difference in how we manage the safety or how we expect people who work for us to manage safety based on how much they happen to be paid. And there are plenty of railways out there who have... Um, a high number of paid people at a high level and volunteers at a low level or a high number of paid people at a low level and volunteers at a high level just based on whatever demographic they've been able to secure. It makes no difference at all the amount that somebody's paid um, as to what the safety expectation should be of them and what their expectation should be of us. So staff is the word that I always use. I can't put a quote on this. I can't remember who said it. So you can tell me in the comments if you remember where you've seen this before, because I'm sure I've seen it written somewhere before, and I certainly didn't come up with it, which is that the SMS must say what we do, and we must do what the SMS says. And that's really important. The SMS is completely worthless if you write something that sounds absolutely fantastic and amazing. And yes, you know, that will definitely go on the weighing scales and weigh three kilograms and that will please the ORR. Well, if you're not going to do what it says, you're almost in a worse position than if you just hadn't said it in the first place. If you're going to say we will maintain this thing three times a day and then you don't do it, uh, as I say, you're, you're in worse trouble. On the other hand, you, um, should not, you should not say we will not maintain this thing at all um, if you feel that it needs maintaining and you're not prepared to justify that you're not maintaining it. And it comes down to you shouldn't be ever be afraid to write something in the SMS if you believe it's the right thing to write. Because if it's the right thing to write, then you should put it in the SMS and you should do it. And if you're not prepared to write it in the SMS, then is that because... Oh, sorry, you should only not write something in the SMS if you don't think it's the right thing for you to be doing. You shouldn't not write it in the SMS because you either don't want to do it or can't do it or won't do it while recognising that it needs to be done. If you can't achieve the things that you have identified need to be done in order to assure safety, that is obviously a bad position to be in. You should either change your operation so that you can service it or find an alternative to what you've decided is necessary to achieve safety. So don't over-egg your SMS, don't make out that everything is uh, a lot more frequently done than it is or a lot more comprehensively done than it is, but also don't go lower than what you believe is the appropriate amount of comprehensiveness uh, for what needs to happen. We either believe in the SMS or we don't believe in our organisation and it can't really be both. Um, yeah, right, okay, let's go over to the template. As always, I've got you a lovely template. Here's the word document template. It's got the usual sort of cover page on it for you. 
This is not your organization's SMS, just in case anyone finds it on hops and mistakenly believes it's uh, their own organizations. Obviously, you will delete this first page uh, if you choose to use the template. It's a bit on there about changes, a bit on there about copyright and how you're licensed to use it. Normal thing, standard front page, big space for you to put your logo. And if you haven't been here before, whatever I do this text in red, that's where I'm expecting you to come along and change this Word document template to put your own, uh, in this case, company name in, or in this case, the initials of your uh, company. <laughs> Now, I must admit, I started off going through this template, uh, putting the red in, in the way that I normally do, uh, and I did find, eventually, that um, it would almost have ended up being all red, because everything in this is, or needs to be customised for your local undertaking. A new little page here that I've put in for you, the document version history. Not a big fan of it myself, but everyone else seems to love it. So as per your feedback, I've put it in and I'll do that for all future SMS templates that we uh, create. Bit of a contents page here. Uh, and I gave these chapters letters. You might prefer to give them numbers. And the reason I say that is because I just went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, O, J, K, as you can see. And these letters don't necessarily directly relate to the letters used in the document numbering system. And that has perhaps caused a little bit of confusion. So I think in my best practice template, I might change it to be chapter one, chapter two, instead of chapter A, chapter B. But it makes very little difference to your compliance with ROGS and the Health and Safety at Work Act and all those other things that we're trying to comply with here, whether you have letters or numbers. I just thought I'd mention that. But that's quite a good set of document headings drawn from various different sources and SMS templates that I've come across over the years. So here we go, part A, a brief description of the railway. Part one, the name and address of the duty holder under ROGS is, and you can write it in there. Um, great discussion to be had over whether the duty holder is a person or an organisation. I always believe it's the organisation and the, the managers uh, of that organisation. Some people will insist that uh, the duty holder is an individual, and I don't hold with that uh, point of view if I'm honest. Uh, not least of all, because when we work for an organisation, everything that we do as individuals is vicariously the responsibility of the organisation, provided we're not negligent uh, in any case. Structure of companies. <coughs> the railway is a medium-sized enterprise, which I thought was a pretty good term to describe everything from the smallest to the largest of heritage railways. In the scheme of businesses in general, we're all medium-sized enterprises. You can obviously change that if you want, excuse me. Operate. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm coughing a bit. Operating a heritage railway and a tourist attraction, and as such, is required to work within both railway and general health and safety legislation. The railway is operated by name of the company that is the ROGS duty holder under a Transport and Works Act order or whatever else other legal frameworks uh, that there are, because I know not everybody is the same in that respect. The duty holding company is a whatever type of company you are and your registration number. And then some extra things for you to add here if they apply. If the duty holder is a subsidiary of a larger organisation, explain here. If the duty holder leases the track or land or buildings or assets from an asset holding company, then explain here. If there is a separate company for retail activities, then explain here. Now, this is going to be, in my imagination, this is going to be the SMS for the railway. And if your railway has um, AB Railway Limited for the duty holder, AB Railway Holdings Limited for the assets, AB Railway Charity for the supporters organisation, AB Railway Retail and Catering for the retailing, most railways have more than one company. And I would suggest you make this the SMS for <coughs> all of those companies, that group of company that runs the railway and put the railway badge on it rather than just limiting it to what you could argue we're required to do, which is make it the SMS of the duty holder, because I think it helps a lot where you've got many different companies all working on the same railway, that everybody has got one SMS to work to. In many, many cases, the rank-and-file staff that work on a railway don't know or understand or recognise what the relationships between the different companies are, or have mistaken beliefs that one runs the railway and the other one provides the volunteers and another one does this and another one does that. And in most cases, it's completely wrong. Um, and in most cases, the duty holder is doing most of the things apart from some financial things in, in different companies. So having one SMS and getting all the different companies to sign up to it 
uh, makes for a much stronger management of safety, a much stronger culture, remember we spoke about on the previous uh, couple of slides. And if there are other companies on site for which the duty holder is responsible, explain here. In practice, all the above companies work together to deliver the railway and the operation is divided into business units for its key communal activities. See the reporting lines chart. There's my favourite word, business units. I've deliberately used business units because it's not a word that is um, in existing use to be confused with existing words. If I called it departments or if I called it the shop or the workshop, everyone's got a different uh, existing definition for what those things mean. So the first level of breakdown of the railway company, in my mind, is the business units. You can have as many business units as you like, and you can call them whatever you like. For the avoidance of doubt, this MS does not cover the activities of, and then if there are any of those companies where you've explicitly decided that it does not cover uh, for the avoidance of doubt. The railway is a standard gauge, or whatever gauge you are, heritage railway, which runs from some location to some other location, an operating distance of some miles. There are key stations at some locations and likely used halts at other locations. This is just overall view of the description of the railway, but it is important because some things will be dependent on this description of the railway remaining current. And there'll be some places in the SMS where we'll say we'll review this if the description of the railway changes. If we open a new station or a new passing loop or a new signal box or whatever it is, this is the description of the railway that the SMS is for. And if the description of the railway changes, we need to make sure the SMS is changed and updated with it. The principal base is at location blah blah where there are locomotive running sheds, workshops, storage sidings, museums, grounds and the administrative offices. Additional storage sidings and other facilities are at such and such a location. The railway is in the geographical and administrative county of some location. The majority of public trains are steam hauled, although heritage diesels are also used periodically and services run on approximately X days of the year. Signaling is controlled from X mechanical boxes plus ground frames and level crossing boxes at some location. The line is approved for a maximum speed of 25 miles an hour or 40 kilometres an hour and an axle load not exceeding however many tonnes. There are a total of X bridge structures on the line, consisting of some underbridges, some overbridges, some underlying culverts as originally built, and some footbridges. There are none or some or many level crossings, mainly of the passive user work type, but with some exceptions, i.e. one open crossing and two manually worked gates and two user work crossings with telephones. Obviously, you will completely pull that paragraph apart in order to say the numbers of things that you've got on your own railway. I do recommend that if you've got none of something, it is still worth mentioning there are no footbridges or there are no level crossings or what, whatever it's going to be, just for the avoidance of doubt and, and the um, obtaining of clarity. Electric traction is not used and the railway does not carry dangerous goods, and I imagine that's uh, the same for most of us. This is the point where I got to where I uh, decided that um, highlighting everything in red uh, was probably not going to be appropriate. And uh, I have continued to highlight some significant stuff in red, but much more so than the other SMS documents that we've talked about, where I think you pretty much can take the template, fill in the gaps, make sure that it's appropriate for your undertaking and then put it into practice. This one is going to require much more thinking about. But hopefully the template will give you the right pointers in the right direction uh, to know what to think about. Right, structure of business units and departments. The organisation is divided into, look at that, brilliant, three business units and there's four of them. Uh, the organisation is divided into four business units. See the safety reporting lines chart. They're the four business units in my utopia of SMSs. Obviously, you will put in what the four or however many there are sort of key levels of organisational responsibility there are uh, in your railway. If it helps, if you think about it, if you've got a general manager and then they've got a team of three or four or six people underneath them with an area of responsibility each, they're the business units. You might find, if you're a really small organisation, that your business units are what another railway might have at the next level down, at the department level, and that's absolutely fine. This is your SMS. If you've only got 20 volunteers and you split them up into operational and commercial, it doesn't matter that there's only 10 volunteers in each business unit, that's fine, whereas the railway down the road has got 200 volunteers in each business unit, it's absolutely fine. This is how the organisation is broken down for the purpose of management, not for the purpose of making constituencies with similar numbers of people in each one. Each business unit encompasses a number of departments and all activity takes place under the management of a department. That's one of my favourite mantras of Heritage Railway Management. All activity takes place under the management of a department. 
Every department has a department manager. Every department manager uh, is part of a business unit and the business units report into the general manager or managing director or whoever it is that you have at the top and try and have one person at the top if you can. And the reason I say all activity takes place under the management of a department is because if there's somebody out there who just turns up on a Thursday and paints things and isn't really part of a department, then who is their line manager? Who is responsible for their safety? Who is responsible for their training and competence and continuous personal development and pastoral care and all of those things? It would be very difficult for us to justify those were being managed. That's not to say don't have any people that just turn up on a Thursday and do painting. It's just to say either put them in a department or make a department for them because it is we owe them that duty of care to manage them. Even if it's a department that isn't the sort of department that you'd think it would be, like you put them in the, in the, in the guards department or something, that's absolutely fine. As long as the guards department manager is equipped to manage them and manage their safety uh, and take care of them, It doesn't actually matter what uh, department you put them in. Some railways have a sundry department or an auxiliary department or a sort of everyone else department that they put those people in who don't really fit in but still provide valuable volunteering service. um, And they put them in that department and just nominate somebody to be those people's line manager. Um, Okay. Part five, the SMS. This document is designed to meet the requirements of the Railways and Other Guided Transport ROGS Regulations 2006. It also forms the basis of the company's observation of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. The safety management system follows best practices from other equivalent heritage railways and HOPS templates adapted to the character and extent of the railway operation described above. The term staff in the SMS includes both paid employees and unpaid volunteers. The railway has a small nucleus of employed staff and a large number of volunteers. Obviously change that sentence so that it tells the truth for your organisation. And from here on in, hopefully, I've just used the word staff. I haven't used the word employees and I haven't used the word volunteers because, as we said a second ago, it doesn't actually matter as far as safety management is concerned. There are some employment-related things where, of course, it does matter um, and employment rights and things like that. But in terms of safety management, I don't believe that it uh, should be... Uh, different. Katie Pickerskill from the Epping Onga Railway has just asked a very good question which says since business units are called disciplines in hops is there an intention to align the two or would they not necessarily align? Well that's a very good question I have thought about it before I think it's just probably if I'm honest that I haven't got round to it I think that in there will be cases where they don't align but I think we should strive to an arrangement where they do I know in many cases, and I've even recommended this myself before, is making a fake department in hops, making a department in hops that doesn't really exist in real life in order to achieve something, in order to um, gain a roster or to gain a load of people on a telephone list or to manage the competence to be a Christmas elf or something like that. Uh, I think we should be moving towards a, a place where there is a real department for those things, even if it's still managed by the same person who manages one of the other departments or whether it just reports directly to the manager of the business unit or whatever it's going to be, I can see that in the fullness of time, what's called disciplines in hops uh, will become called business units. Um, But we will go there slowly. Right, here we are, part B, safety policy. And this is the first example, I think, of this going on. Remember I said this was a pointer document. This isn't going to tell us the answer because we don't want to have to change the overall document every time we want to change something on the railway, every time we want to change a word in a competence system or review the safety policy statement or something like that. So we state that a safety policy statement exists or whatever it is that exists, and we refer to it here. And then even if, obviously, uh, sorry, this should be in red, even if your your SMS2 safety policy statement changes, the SMS overall document doesn't need to change because it still points to SMS2. So the Railway Safety Policy Statement describes the overall company's approach to health and safety. Uh, And that will be a one-pager that's pinned up on all the signing on boards, all the health and safety notice boards, um, that says things like, we will always uh, engage with our staff on safety and we will expect our staff to follow the safety processes and, and systems that we have in place. Um, we will always strive to improve, we will always strive to minimise risk and injury, all of those sorts of things. But again, not uh, not actually saying any detail about how those things are going to be done, it's the policy statement, it's what all the other documents that support it are supposed to be contributing towards achieving. 
maybe one day we'll have a very brief uh, SMS workshop on what a safety policy statement could contain. Maybe one day we might all be working to the same safety policy statement. That would be amazing. The policy and direction set out to the, by the board of whatever the company is for all the companies in the group follows the principles that health and safety is, is the responsibility of every individual. The health and safety policy sets a clear direction for the organisation to follow. The policy, displayed on notice boards and at booking on points, contributes to all aspects of business performance and as part of a demonstrable commitment from the top of the organisation. Uh, reporting lines and responsibilities for establishing and monitoring processes is as shown in the chart below. And in fact, it's uh, quite some distance below, but we will get there. Right, safety policy, health and safety committee. I recommend that you have one of these where all of the health and safety reps from all of the departments, which yes, you will have a health and safety rep in the department, which by default, if nobody else is specifically appointed, will be the department manager, comes together once every three months and forms this health and safety committee or whatever you want to call it that amounts to the same thing to make sure that there is always the opportunity for that health and safety discussion to flow both upwards and downwards. So the company has a health and safety committee whose remit is defined in sub-document. It consists of a chairman, representatives of the railway management, other department managers and volunteers, oh, I've used the word volunteers, and staff representing other grades plus representatives of affiliated support groups. So it should have a broad um, spectrum of representatives from across the company. The safety manager post is an ex officio member of the committee and has the right of direct access to the board. Other people are co-opted to HASCOM as the need arises. All of the members of HASCOM are actively involved in the operation of the railway and therefore able to raise H&S concerns that may arise from other members of staff. Yes, there's no point in having a health and safety committee formed of six people who are absolute health and safety experts but aren't in the, involved in the railway and don't come to the railway and don't see what goes on in practice. See what I mean here about, I've written three paragraphs about the Health and Safety Committee that define the overall sort of policy for what the Health and Safety Committee is going to be and everything else is going to be in whatever your company is, slash SMS, slash H1. Um, and that could change uh, more frequently than the SMS overall document changes. Matters involving the statutory safety regulator, the ORR, and the Rail Accident Investigation Branch are dealt with by the manager of the relevant business unit or nominated deputy in the first instance. The general manager is responsible for the delivery of safety policy and improvement and reports to each board meeting on health, safety and risk issues. I recommend that in your board meeting standard agenda that you always have, there is an everlasting uh, entry on the agenda for health, safety and risk issues and you require the general manager to say something interesting in that part of the, uh, of the meeting. Uh, there is always something to say on health, safety and risk issues. I do not believe uh, any report that says no, there's nothing to report when it comes to health, safety and risk issues on a heritage railway. A responsibility exists for all staff to engage with the company's safety management and improvement processes to take care of their own health and safety and that of others and to actively report issues near misses or concerns. Actively report. It is the responsibility to actively report stuff. And we'll talk about that now. Near misses reporting and concern raising and escalation. The railway maintains a system of near miss reporting tickets which are dealt with in accordance with the policy for near miss reporting. And a concern raising an escalation policy, SMS slash Z slash 9A. This is called various different things in different companies, the work safe procedure, the whistleblowing procedure, you know, all those sorts of things. But it underlines the fact that whether you've been in the company for, for 20 years or two days, if you have a concern, you have the entitlement to stop work and raise it with your supervisor. And if you're not happy about that, you're entitled to raise it up a level. And if you're not happy about that, you're entitled to raise it up a level. And three is the sort of normal number of raising up of levels that these things generally tend to have. And if three different levels of management in the company have decided that it is probably safe, then obviously that member of staff has the choice, as if they're a volunteer, as to whether to volunteer to do that task or not. And if they're an employee to either, well, to go back to work, I guess. Um, right. Uh, all staff have access to the company's system for reporting safety hazards concerned and near misses via the good old spot report system in hops, which hopefully you'll all eventually come to use. But if you have another system, then obviously you'll delete that and put in what the, just the, the te title of the system is. SMS slash said slash 9B will explain the detail of the mechanism of how that system works and what happens to things that are reported in it. One day we'll have an SMS workshop on it. 
The Railways, Drugs and Alcohol Policy is defined in yet another sub-document. See, this is very easy. It's just like something that we've identified. Yep, we'll have a sub-document for it. Protection of Children and Vulnerable Persons. The Railways Policy for the Protection of Children and Vulnerable Persons is defined in SMSZ2. And the Policy for Lost and Found Children is in SMSZ11. Z being the letter for everything else. The Railways Policy for Loan Working, which we have already had a SMS workshop on, is in SMS slash Z slash 1. Thank you very much indeed to the organisations that are busy testing out the loan working components of Time Register. And of course, when that's fully adopted, you will need to amend your SMS slash Z1 or whatever number you've given it in order to um, discuss and communicate this new method of um, safely managing the risk arising from working alone. The Railways Policy regarding personal track safety and higher visibility clothing, which I'm pretty sure, yep, we've had a workshop on that, SMS slash Z slash, sorry, SMS slash T slash 1, T for track. So I tried to keep this to as minimum as possible and just point to the document that it applies in. Right, the organisations. We've talked a little bit about this, but this is going to go into a bit more detail now. There are four principal levels of management in the delivery of the company's business. One, two, three, four. Number one, the board of directors. Number two, the general manager. Number three, the business units with managers of business units. And number four, the department heads. And this makes a bit of a sort of an hourglass shaped company structure, but it is what most heritage railways end up on by nature of it being primarily volunteer. Um, in my view, and I'm sure there will be people who disagree, we'll have one general manager or pick a job title, but we'll have one person controlling the show at level number two. And he will have or she will have a load of business units underneath them and each business unit manager will have a load of departments underneath them. And the directors above the general manager are long-term strategic thinkers. I don't really tend to like it when the board has a commercial director and an engineering director and an operations director and a retail director and a tea and coffee director and a director for this, that and the other because it makes this person's job extremely difficult when the delivery of the railway, which is vast in most cases, is being split up and controlled by half a dozen people at the board level, sort of cutting out the general manager person in the middle. And no matter how good or cohesive board that you've got, it will always be very difficult for six people to control one railway or ten people to control one railway. It's always easier for one person to control one railway with people above them delivering the long-term strategy, the long-term direction, um, the long-term finance, and have a general manager that delivers the organisation on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis, supported by all the people in the business units and the departments. On railways that I've seen and worked on and, and been to for hops meetings and things, I always find it very difficult to hammer out who's responsible for what in terms of responsibility lines where the directors have direct portfolios for the output of the business on a day-to-day basis. You may work on a railway where that works perfectly, and if you do, then that's absolutely fine. As with all this stuff, I'm not saying this is what you have to do, I'm just saying that's my experience. And just to reiterate, as if I hadn't said it enough, all activity takes place under the management of a department. The railway is governed by a board of directors, the company board, which is the top level of the organisation's management. The board appoint the general manager and provide overall governance, guidance and support to the general manager in the discharge of their responsibilities, including those relating to safety. And of course it flows down, the general manager will appoint the managers of the business units, the managers of the business units will appoint the heads of departments. Uh, And of course the responsibility flows back up again. Right, so here's the business units. The operation of the company under the direction of the board of directors is divided into, again, three. Sorry, you can tell that I got this from several different (laughs) organisations. Three or four different business units, each of which has a manager of the business unit. So just to be clear, there'll be, for example, an operations business unit, and the operations business unit will have a manager of the business unit, and here you will define who that person is. It's the operations manager in this fictitious example. The fact that we have business units and managers of the business unit does not mean that somebody's job title has to be manager of the business unit. Their job title can still be commercial manager, and the SMS here defines that the commercial manager is the manager of the business unit for the commercial business unit. 
It's exactly the same as, uh, for example, on the mainline railway rule book, it refers to guard in, in connection with uh, duties on trains. But lots of different train operating companies call their equivalent role different things, conductor or train manager or all those different things. And somewhere it'll say, you're the train manager, here's your job description, you are responsible for carrying out the duties shown as guard in the rule book. And it'll be exactly the same here. The operations manager will be responsible for timetables and galas and visiting engines and assessing people and all those different things. P.S. Last bullet point. This role is defined as the manager of the business unit for the operations business unit. Another good example that I was given was to do with naming of signals. If you're into signalling, as I am, there'll be a home signal and a, st a starting signal. Sorry, there'll be a home signal and a section signal. Sometimes the section signal is the home signal. Sometimes the section signal is the starting signal. Sometimes the section signal is the advanced starting signal. They all have their own names, but one of them is the section signal because it admits entry to the section. One of them is the home signal because it's the one that admits entry to the station limits. Still a section signal, even though it's the intermediate, advanced, starting, or whatever it is. And we have to have a little fallback here, just in case any of these um, uh, positions aren't filled, which is sometimes the case on railways, as we know. The position shall ideally always be filled, and if not, the responsibility automatically passes to the general manager. So it's in the general manager's interest to get a new person in place, even if they're a temporary person, to assume the responsibilities of the commercial manager, let's say. Because if there's no commercial manager and nobody temporarily appointed to be the manager of the business unit, it automatically becomes the responsibility of the general manager. This is really important. I can't remember where it was, but I'm sure somebody can tell me in the comments where there was a plane crash because both of the pilots believed the other person was flying the plane when they were looking into whatever the problem was. And neither of them were actually flying it because they didn't communicate properly, uh, and the plane crashed. So we don't want to have that in the case of a railway, so we've got a little fallback here that states what automatically happens if a manager of the business unit uh, job is vacant. Departments. Each business unit is divided into departments. Each department has a head of department appointed by the manager of the business unit. The engineering business unit is divided into departments. Each department has a head of department. Oh, I've said the same thing twice. Uh, so here is a list, and again, I just made this up, really, of the departments that I think might come under an engineering business unit. Same thing for a commercial business unit. Same things for an operations business unit. There we go. It's always much easier to uh, see your mistakes when you're talking about them out loud, isn't it? Uh, obviously, you will chop that up however you want. You can see I've totally abandoned the red now, but it is important to have a list of departments and to state which uh, business unit each one comes into. Even if you completely don't like the term business unit and you say, oh, we're not having any of that nonsense here, we'll call them what we call them, thank you very much. Please do still state how the company is divided up and what departments are in each of the the units of management that you've decided are going to be the case. Again, there have definitely been accidents, including on heritage railways, where the people who, I won't say responsible, but were factors in the uh, accident, had the wrong idea about what department they worked for or who their line manager was and where that sat in the company. Um, and that definitely led to both um, conflicting instructions which is obviously not good for the safety of management, or no instructions at all, which is definitely not good for the safety of management, excuse me. Sorry, I've got a bad cough. Okay, each department will have a head of department and a safety rep. Fallback is, if no safety rep is appointed, the head of department becomes the safety rep. So every department, by definition, has a safety rep. Other roles in the department may also exist, such as training manager, trainers, assessors, inspectors, roster clerks, whatever you want. The name of the manager of each department is maintained in the department list on hops. Remember the manager field in the department list? And it's perfectly acceptable. That's a perfectly controlled source, as long as you control who has permission to edit it, to say in the SMS that instead of being in a sub-document, it'll be on a computer system. Function supervisors. Now, we did talk about this a couple of uh, workshops ago. So we just said that there will be board, general manager, or whatever you call it, managers of the business units, and then heads of departments. And all of those roles are individual people who are appointed to those roles, and they are always those roles. The manager of the engineering business unit, whether they're on duty or at home asleep in bed, is still the manager of the business unit. But because we are not in a position, as most railways, to have those staff on duty all the time, we invented this thing called function supervisors, which is the person on duty 
who is the sort of supervisor of the day-to-day work, the representative of the manager of the business unit or the head of department, but without necessarily all the authority, is the sort of the shift manager type role. The managers of the business units and the heads of departments are individuals appointed to the role. For the supervision of day-to-day work, a function supervisor may be appointed. And a function supervisor, incidentally, could span across many or even all uh, departments and business units. A duty officer will be a for oh, I keep seeing railway business unit instead of operations business unit. A duty officer will be appointed as the function supervisor for the operations business unit whenever passenger trains are in operation. A supervisor will be appointed as the function supervisor for the engineering business unit at all times when engineering work is taking place. The function supervisor will normally be the manager of the business unit when on site. And when the manager of the business unit is not on site, they will appoint a person to deputise. You see, this is just made up examples of how the function supervisor could be identified. Most railways have a duty officer role or equivalent. and There's normally a roster for it or you're on duty for three days or a week or whatever it is. Whereas engineering is quite often a... Um, I won't say nine to five because that's definitely not true, but it's slightly more geographically constrained perhaps to a workshop or a loco shed or whatever. And if there's manager of the business unit is there nearly all the time, it's quite acceptable to say, well, whenever the manager of the business unit's there, they will be the function supervisor. When they're not, somebody they trust will be appointed to deputise. Another example, a commercial business unit perhaps does not attract as significant safety risk as the other business units, and a supervisor may be appointed in this business unit, or the duty officer may supervise this as well. So you can pull that apart however it already works for your railway, as long as you're prepared to stand by writing down what you're currently doing. If you're not prepared to do that, remember what we said at the start, then you should either, well, you should change what you're doing if you're not prepared to write it down. Part six, safety critical roles. In many departments, there are a number of safety critical roles. These roles are identified from the ROGS regulations and also that helpful ORR document that I uh, linked you to a few workshops ago. I'll find it again. It's very good at listing heritage railway roles that are safety critical. You can find it on Google. If you type in ORR, safety critical roles on heritage railways, um, you'll find it. Uh, and roles identified by the company as having safety critical importance. In addition, some roles carry very high, sorry, carry high levels of safety and hygiene importance outside of ROGS. Um, so there is safety outside of ROGS. Uh, competence of staff carrying out safety critical tasks is managed in accordance with SMS C1, which is one of the examples we gave in that chart at the beginning. C1, the overall competence document for the whole organisation. And each department's competence management sub-policy, SMS slash C slash whatever letter of the department it is, slash 12345. Part 7, job descriptions for the following roles are contained in the document shown. I think in my next uh, review of this uh, template, I'm going to take this list out and I'm going to have a sub-document called SMS J1, which is going to list all of the roles that have job descriptions, because this is definitely something that could change relatively frequently, uh, and we don't want to have to reissue the SMS overall document uh, every time it does. Here is where we will put, or you will put, the family tree that shows in graphical form the relationship between the board at the top with a little arrow pointing down to the general manager with five arrows pointing to the five managers of the business units and then all the departments that are in each business unit underneath each uh, business unit. Um, that's the place to show that graphically to make sure that there can be no possible misunderstanding over who somebody's line manager is, who they work for, where their safety reporting line is. Right, part D. Risk assessments, and although the subject of risk assessments will be massive, this is only the overall document, so it's only three paragraphs here, because of course it links to SMSK1, the risk management policy. The company's risk assessment policy, SMSK1, details the processes for ensuring that risks are conducted, reviewed, sorry, risk assessments are conducted, reviewed and updated. The same procedure describes the criteria that are used in the assessment of risk. Risk assessments are reviewed to determine how effective control and mitigation measures have been in practice and determine whether the risk continues to be as low as reasonably practicable or whether additional control measures need to be put in place to further reduce the level of risk. 
They cover all activities relating to the railway operation, public and staff safety on the trains, public areas, catering and retail areas, and workshop areas in addition to the risks relating to or caused by third parties, e.g. neighbouring landowners, trespassers, and the general public outside the railway boundary. So my policy, which I've said many times so far today, is keep it as short as we can reasonably get away within the overall document, link to a sub-document, and then absolutely put as much detail as you want to in the sub-document, just to stop the overall document getting too unwieldy. Part E, competence management. Um, the competences required to undertake all roles are outlined in the competence management system, SMSC1, agreed by the heads of department and the manager of the business unit who also monitor the performance of all staff. All new staff are allocated tasks requiring... So, all new staff, emphasis in the wrong place, all new staff are allocated tasks requiring any basic competence and responsibility until their capability is proven. The manager of the business unit is responsible for ensuring that only appropriately qualified staff undertake the various operational duties. Now, even though the manager of the business unit will almost certainly delegate the responsibility of um, selecting, training, assessing, all those things to the individual staff in the individual departments, the manager of the business unit is responsible for cracking the whip to make sure, making sure that it's done correctly in their business unit. Now, why did we stop at manager of the business unit there? Why didn't we say head of department or why didn't we say general manager or why didn't we say board? Because actually, if there is a significant incident, after speaking to the manager of the business unit, the police will want to speak to the general manager and then they'll want to speak to the board. Well, the reason, in my mind, is that the manager of the business unit needs to be appointed um, as somebody who has the technical skills as well as the management skills to properly manage the technical activities that go on in their department, the risk arising from them, and to have the experience and um, knowledge to make technical judgments. They will um, certainly coach the heads of department to do so, and the heads of department, all those things that I just said still apply to the head of department within their sort of department silo. But if we relied just on the heads of departments, we would get a big disparity in the perception of risk. Because something that's very, very risky in one department is actually not very risky compared to the risks in another department. So to keep that sort of level playing field of how risk is perceived, we stopped it at the manager of the business unit. Oh, sorry, we made it go up as high as the manager of the business unit. We didn't go up any higher because it's probably unreasonable to expect one general manager to have technical knowledge to the point of making technical judgments on every single aspect of technical and operational stuff that goes on across the entire railway. That's probably not a reasonable thing to expect somebody to be an expert in signalling and guarding and dispatch and driving every single type of loco and working in the shop and the cafe and the permanent way and the S&T and the garden and the miniature railway. Probably not so reasonable. If it had been, we would have gone up even higher. The general manager needs to manage the managers of the business unit to make sure that this takes place. The managers of the business unit needs to be the ones doing the assurance on the competence evidence that the assessors and heads of departments are uploading to HOPS as evidence of their competence decision making. Each department that manages the competence of safety critical staff maintains a competence management system policy as detailed in C1. So, for example, in the S&T, for which I think the letters A, there will be a SMS slash C slash A and maybe slash 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, and again, that is the example of the tree structure that I gave right at the beginning. Part two, safety critical competence management. All staff carrying out safety critical work undergo training in the discipline concerned and are required to pass examinations in the appropriate rules and regulations for taking up work. And remember, this is the overall document. So C1 can't, uh, can't deviate from that. This is defining something that's going to apply across the whole railway and C1 will have to conform with it and the departments will have to conform with that and what's in C1. So there's no getting away from it that all staff carrying out safety critical work will undergo and be required to pass examinations before taking up work. Examinations are conducted by assessors, having extensive knowledge of the discipline concerned, and staff are required to be able to demonstrate all the competence criteria to the satisfaction of the assessor and display a suitable attitude and awareness of the task concerned. And I always say to assessors that the pass mark is that they have to persuade you. 
And I know that might um, bring in some subjectiveness to the assessment, but the assessor is ultimately the one who's going to sign to say that the person can do the job. And even if you can answer all the questions correctly, if I don't believe that you've got the attitude and awareness of the task concerned, I'm still not going to pass you out. Um, so there's no guaranteed passes, is what we're saying here. The training and assessment criteria for each safety critical role are defined in the Department Competence Management. I've called it a sub-policy there. I haven't used sub-policy elsewhere. But that will be SMS slash C slash A1, for example. All new staff undergo a half-day induction course and attend a safety management briefing. All those staff who will be required to work on or near the line also complete PTS training. Oh, that should, of course, say all the line side or on the line side. Also complete PTS training and assessment at the same time. Of course, whatever induction and PTS training regime applies on your railway, uh, you'll amend that paragraph to apply. Training is coordinated by training officers in each discipline change that to department and is generally accomplished on the job by the trainee working up through the ranks alongside qualified staff of course it is good that a lot of railways have signal schools and guard schools and things like that over the winter amongst all the other mutual improvement sessions that are run but the majority of technical training on heritage railways i'm sure we'll all agree is achieved by working on the job alongside um, other qualified staff Evidence of all training is kept and the current status of all staff's competence is recorded. Remember what ROG said? Uh, what was it? Written, up-to-date and accurate record of competence is what it said in ROGS. The manager of the business unit is responsible for the maintenance of records of training and competence. And again, the reason it's manager of the business unit is the same as I described previously. That yes, he will delegate the task of actually doing it to the head of department and the assessors. But he's or she is the person who... Um, is expected to have enough technical competence of all of the departments in the business units to make sure that it's being done properly, whereas that's probably not so reasonable for the general manager. Occasional meetings or mutual improvement courses are held with staff to provide briefings on significant changes to the rulebook, mutual improvement classes and general communications to provide two-way feedback on any aspects of railway operation. Some training is offered in purpose-built courses and some is learned by working with existing competent staff all competences are assessed and demonstrable evidence obtained. I think we've probably said the sentences in that last paragraph twice, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Right, so here's a controversial thing which we've talked about before, specialist skills from external agencies. Any staff undertaking specialist functions described in health and safety legislation or identified in risk assessment, such as crane drivers, grinder operators, chainsaw operators, operators of weed killing sprays, catering staff involved in food preparation and so on, are trained by an appropriate specialist external trainer and certificates maintained up to date. And remember what we discussed when we talked about competence is that you can't just randomly pick an external trainer out of the yellow pages and send people to it. You have to be able to demonstrate that what this external trainer is training and assessing is appropriate for the risks that, you're, uh, that the role the person is doing is going to be exposed to. There have definitely been cases before where a person has turned up with a certificate from some dodgy training company, gone and done the thing, had an accident, and then it's been established that whatever was trained and assessed at the dodgy training company um, did not uh, by any means mitigate the risks that, to which the person was exposed. All workshop staff are appointed on the basis of qualifications and experience and are closely supervised during their trial periods. So that was an extra little thing that I found specifically for workshop staff using lathes and milling machines and things like that, um, that they'll be appointed based on their uh, qualifications and experience. Uh, which has to be demonstrated still. Part 7, staff undertaking duties that require medical fitness are assessed according to the medical fitness procedure, SMS slash Z5. And risks associated with the fatigue are recognised and managed in accordance with the policy SMS Z4. So I completely shipped everything to do with those things out into a sub-policy. Part F, railway operations. So railway operations gets its own special part here. There's not going to be a separate part for engineering and catering and all those other things. Railway operations gets its own special chapter. The responsibility for the operational management of the operations business unit is held by the manager of the operations business unit, who maintains day-to-day -day control over railway operational activities. The manager of the operations business unit is assisted by a whoever. 
operations assistant, deputy operations manager, operations superintendent, and called all sorts of different things. The daily operations of the railway are supervised by a duty officer, which is a function supervisor, including the response to any disruption or incidents. The duty officer reports to the manager of the operations business unit. There is a duty officer's mobile telephone, which is always in the possession of the duty duty officer. Ha! The duty duty officer. This enables staff to know the telephone number to call to reach the duty officer without necessarily knowing who the duty officer is before the call. The duty officer maintains a daily log in hops. Procedures for observation by DOs are contained in the operations manual. Procedure SMS slash M. M for manual slash two slash, sorry, M for management slash two for the operations manual and then slash whatever number of the operations manual procedure um, it's going to be in. On special event days, a duty event supervisor may also be appointed who is responsible for the off-railway events, such as entertainment, bars, music, etc. Please, please don't underestimate the safety impact of off-railway events, such as events, bars and music, etc. You can imagine it would be very easy for a duty officer to feel that they're only responsible for the railway element of what's going on and perhaps not have the skills or experience to deal with things relating to entertainment, bars and music. So a duty event supervisor is definitely a good idea um, on days where there are significant events going on in order to make sure that the event has a good management structure the same as we've been talking about in operations. The duty event supervisor reports to the duty officer and does not carry any responsibilities concerning the operational railway. Special briefing documents may be issued to staff on special event days containing timetables, etc. Rule book. The rule book governs the operation of the railway. The rule book is SMS slash R slash 2, because of course it's part of the SMS. Rule books are issued to those staff whose roles require them and must be signed for by the recipient. It is periodically reviewed and if amendments are required, they are issued using the same control system. The rule book is supported by a general appendix, SMS slash R slash 3, and local instructions exist to modify rules in appropriate local circumstances, SMS slash R slash 4. Further instructions document also exist at a lower level, such as the signalling general instructions, SMS slash R slash 5, the regulations for train signalling in the electric token block system, SMS slash R slash 11, and the signal box instructions, SMS slash R slash 6789 in this particular case, but obviously if you've got three signal boxes, you'll only need three numbers. A weekly operating notice, or a fortnightly notice, or whatever it is you have, uh, SMS slash R slash W and then the week in the year, still part of the SMS, you're still relying on it for the delivery of safety, so the one is part of the SMS, everything's part of the SMS. It contains details of each week's planned operations, changes to operations publications, temporary speed restrictions and special safety notices, items published in the one that are changes to other publications remain in the one each week until taken over by the PON. The PON is published every three months, or however frequently you want to issue it, and it contains amendments to operating publications that have previously been published in WANs. These items remain in the PON every three months until the publication in which they belong is reissued. So if you're not familiar with this, this rulebook one PON structure, if you want to put out a notice to say do this, do that, or do the other, you put it in the one until either it no longer applies or a PON is issued, and then you take it out of the one and you put it in the pond. And you keep it in the pond forevermore until it either no longer applies or the publication in which it permanently lives is reissued and then you put it in there and take it out the pond. So at the beginning of every three-month period, the one starts off really thin and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker until three months later, everything gets taken out of it and put in a new pond. And the one starts off really thin again for another three months. And the pond every three months gets a bit thicker and a bit thicker and a bit thicker. And once every hmm, year, or let's be honest, three or four or five years, the pond gets emptied and everything gets put into the rule book. So the crucial thing is that no matter when a member of staff joins the organisation and no matter what day they're working, if they've got a rule book, a one and a pond, they have everything up to date. Don't go down the road of updating the rule book, template, word document, whatever it is, every time you want to change something and then giving new people that come in the new rule book because then everybody's got a different version of the rule book. Nobody knows whether what's in the one applies to them or not and it turns into a complete disaster. Give new people a rule book that you know has rules in it that you've amended, no matter how counterintuitive that may um, seem, 
and then give them a one and a pon and tell them to go away and get the pair of scissors and the glue stick out and amend their rule book based on what's in the one and the pon. And that's a really good way of making people learn and understand the relationship between the rule book and the one and the pon. And I'm always really surprised at how many um, people on railways that have that structure don't actually understand that relationship. And obviously it's very, very important to understand what overrides what. I know some railways don't have a one and a pawn at all or a fortnightly and a whatever, however often you have it. They don't have that structure. They just issue notices and then cancel them. And I'm never very keen that that's a very sort of controlled um, way of doing something, especially where you find conflicts, which we all know definitely exist between these publications, to know what overrides what overrides what. If you don't fancy the task of having to issue a one every single week, just make it a fortnightly or even make it a monthly. Um, but I would say have a publication that is always in effect or that a current version is always in effect and, and do issue it um, at the frequency that you decide. Um, that's a strong way to, to manage this structure of rule books. Um, in the PON 1 and rulebook, new items since the last issue are identified with a thick black line in the margin. Wands and pawns are posted on hops at signing on points and signal boxes, and paper copies are also available on demand from the traffic office, or whatever you call your office where your operation staff live. Late notices are posted, are posted where urgent operating advice is required to be given that cannot wait until the publication of the next one, i.e. emergency speed restrictions. These are posted on the relevant signing on points. Now somewhere, and I can't exactly remember where, and I should have really noted what document it's in here, is the policy for urgent operating advice such as emergency speed restrictions. And it goes something like, you'll pin it up on the notice boards, you'll tell the signalman, the signalman will tell all the drivers who are currently on duty, the drivers will be responsible for handing it over if they hand over to somebody else during the rest of the day because you've only got to make it to the end of the day on a heritage railway and then everybody else who comes on duty tomorrow will see it in the late notice case at the signing on point. Part four, timetables. The working timetables are published in the PON or a separate working timetable document depending on how on many different working timetables you've got. Alterations to the timetable are published in the one or by late notice or for very short-term changes, verbal advice from the duty officer. I know that isn't how it works on the main line, but that is does seem to be a process that works quite well on Heritage Railways, having timetables in the one and pon uh, that works quite well. Signalling, there are a number of signal boxes. The method of block working is electric token block, in most cases, or whatever it is, if it isn't, train staff or train staff and ticket. All three signal boxes are equipped with mechanical lever frames and conventional instruments and block working equipment and all operational signalling activities are covered by the rulebook, SMS R2 and associated other documents. Stations, the railway has some stations at some locations plus some small hulks at some other locations. Such and such stations are restored as near as possible to represent the conditions that would have existed between 1930 and 1960, but adapted where necessary to allow for current standards for health and safety and disabled access. Just to acknowledge the balance between what we're trying to preserve and what we are mandated to provide, adaptations where necessary. Station buildings are risk assessed in line with the company's policy, SMS K1, and station operations are detailed in the rulebook, including dispatch arrangements. A station operations manual specification exists, SMS slash N, N for station N, because all the other letters had gone, station N, slash 1, and each station has its own compliance manual, SMS slash 234, etc., to cover the specific local operational and safety policies and procedures locally at each station, how to unlock it, how to lock it up, where to put the boards, where the fire exits are, um, where the escape points are, all those sorts of things, um, one for each station, station operations manual. Right, we're nearly there, I promise. What time is it? It's uh, 20 past 8, so we're not doing too badly. Section G, maintenance. Now, this is another section where I think it's probably long, it's, it's become longer than it needs to be for the overall document. Uh, permanent way management of maintenance. The permanent way track and civils are managed in accordance with policy SMS PW1. You can see most of the documents that are linked from this overall document are slash one, and that's, you know, no coincidence. There will be a PW2345678 and they might well be mentioned in PW1, but PW1 is going to be like the sub-SMS sub-pointer um, document for P-Way. 
Patrols and inspections are carried out in accordance with SMSPW2. If any serious defect is found which could endanger the safe which could endanger safety, the patrolman is required to take immediate steps to protect the site from approaching trains and report the circumstances as soon as possible in accordance with the rule book. Permanent way standards and tolerances are defined in SMS slash PW3. Records are kept as shown below. Again, this is definitely something that I would now take out of my overall document template and put in either PW1 or a sub-document that PW1 refers to. Signaling and telecommunications. s and assets are recorded in the asset register. The register specification is detailed in SMS slash A slash 6 slash 1. A for S and T. Again, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel a bit for letters here by the time we got to S and T, so it's A for S and T. Uh, and the register itself forms SMS slash A slash 6 slash 2. It's important to identify, in the case of any asset management, not just s and what the assets actually are. And it is surprising when you try and stick rigidly to identifying what the assets are and having a list, how frequently you'll need to change it. Because new assets arrive, depart, things get broken down, scrapped, added together, all those sorts of things. And it's extremely easy for those to slip under the radar if a specific asset register is not maintained. Obviously, the best asset register that you could possibly have for S&T assets is the one in HOPS. Uh, maintenance of signalling and telecoms equipment is managed as prescribed in SMS slash A slash 1. Maintenance procedures are drawn from pretty typical S&T policies from British Rail and Network Rail. Signalling and telegraph equipment is practically checked as part of the duties of the signalman when booking on for duty and any defects discovered are reported via the reporting of defects section of SMS slash A slash 1. Form is provided to capture key defect data SMS slash A slash 9. Quarterly checklists are provided for each of the three principal signalling locations, SMS slash A3, 4 and 5, and a checklist is also provided for structures examinations, SMS A10. Inspection cards are also maintained for the following items of equipment. Again, I'm starting to think that this should possibly be an SMS slash A slash 1 rather than here in the overall document, but it started off as just three or four paragraphs and it's gradually been added to and added to as this template has developed over the years uh, that particularly I've been working with railways on SMSs, but also based on what you've sent in. Hopefully all these things will exist, some sort of track circuit inspection card, FPL detection card, power supplies, treadles, lead acid batteries, point machines, voltage records, things like that, um, where you will record whatever frequency you determine is the appropriate frequency to check these things and then save that bit of paper or scan it and upload it to the maintenance task in HOPS so that if required, not only could you go back and look at it, but you could also demonstrate that you were doing them and had had a proactive maintenance regime uh, in the months and years before the incident. A list of operational telephones at the railway is given in SMS A8. I'm pretty sure we'll find that telephones are uh, listed as safety critical equipment if they're uh, telephones on which um, uh, assistance could be summoned in an emergency. So certainly SPTs, line side telephones, telephones in signal boxes, please don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because they're telephones they're not safety critical because, and it may even be in that um, uh, ORR document on safety critical roles that has the chapter on heritage railways that I mentioned earlier, I think it is that people who work on telephones that could be used in an emergency are safety critical staff. A risk rationale and commentary for S&T is given in SMS A11. I know I haven't shown you all these documents, maybe I'll show you them at some point uh, in an SMS workshop, but this is to give you a taste of the overall documents and where I feel it should point to sub-documents. Front page. Bridges and earthworks. Responsibility for the inspection and maintenance of bridges, culverts and earthworks on the railway lies with the manager of the engineering business unit. As the freehold owner of the railway, the company is responsible for the maintenance inspection of all bridges on the railway. Such and such a county council assists the railway with road over rail bridges that have a public highway across them, but this is only in an advisory capacity. I've seen all sorts of different arrangements that railways have managed to strike up with local councils about who's going to maintain things, who's going to inspect them, all those different things. Don't put every single detail here in the overall document, put it in a sub-document, but provide here an overall taste that you, if you had to describe it to somebody in 30 seconds, this is what you would say as to how the bridges are maintained. The bridges, culverts and earthworks are all subject to a full inspection every five years, which is undertaken by an independent bridge engineer. 
On an annual basis, the bridges are inspected visually by the such and such engineer who is assisted by the manager of the engineering business unit. The annual bridge inspections are undertaken based upon a format that utilizes as a guide the historic BR annual bridge inspection format and recorded in SMS PW108, the record of annual bridge inspection. Copies of these reports are held by the manager of the engineering business unit, let's say hopefully by scanning them and uploading them to the maintenance task in HOPS, and the five yearly report Forms, the five yearly report forms the basis for establishing priorities, immediately immediate repair requirements, and also to plan the medium term infrastructure maintenance and repair program. <gasps> the annual report seeks to ensure that structures remain fit for purpose and safe to use. They also monitor any significant defects that the five yearly report have identified. Any developing structural issues are immediately reported to the manager of the engineering business units. The manager of the engineering business units and the permanent way manager undertake an annual visual inspection of all earthworks, um, which inspects in detail any areas of concern with regards to the company's infrastructure. Work on bridges, culverts and earthworks is either carried out in-house or by specialist contractors. A record is maintained of all work undertaken on bridges and culverts, just like a record is maintained of all work done on anything. Um, of any major earthworks repair or construction, bridge strike instructions and procedures are detailed in document number SMS slash PWA slash 600. Far more here than I think really wants to be in the um, bridges and earthworks and in the S&T sections of the overall documents. Just pointing to the sub-documents, I think, next time I review this, uh, some of that will get moved down a level. The text will still exist in the system for managing safety, they just won't be here in the overall document. They'll be in a sub-document. All items of rolling stock will be maintained according to one of the following sections. Steam, diesel, carriage and wagon or on-track plant. All the locomotives and rolling stock resident on the company's lines are owned, hired or leased by the company or under private ownership with another company or companies provided uh, with... Oh, sorry. Under private ownership with this company providing siding space. All operational locomotives and stock used to run public services are treated as company controlled for the purpose of operation and maintenance unless a lease agreement specifically provides otherwise. And it's really difficult to get a maintenance agreement that specifically provides for every possible permutation of maintenance circumstance such that a locomotive owning group could separately be responsible for the maintenance of an engine that the duty holder of the railway then operates on public trains with its staff. It's a sort of a Great Western and Hitachi or LNER and Hitachi type um, uh, agreement with the 800s and, and certainly other types of um, leased rolling stock as well. I really don't feel that it lends itself well to the resources of a heritage railway. And I feel it works a lot, lot better if the two organisations just work more closely together, lease the locomotive for 10 years and say, right, we're now in control of it. Obviously, you can still carry on and doing all the work, but it's under our auspices, under our SMS, following our rule book, rather than trying to come up with a maintenance agreement that we could demonstrate adequately controls all the risk. It wouldn't be acceptable to have a maintenance agreement that says we will maintain the loco. It would have to go into every detail, mitigating every risk that the railway has identified to make sure that this separate locomotive owning group um, maintains it appropriately. Um, mm -mm. All locomotives in operational use are regularly maintained and serviced in accordance with the steam locomotive maintenance policy, SMS L1, or the diesel locomotive policy, SMS D1. DMUs haha, shall be considered locomotives for the purpose of maintenance of the traction, driving and braking equipment and carriages for bodywork and internal decoration. Carriage and wagon maintenance. All carriage and wagon stop in operational use is regularly maintained, examined and serviced in accordance with the vehicle maintenance policy, SMS slash W slash 1. W for wagon, we couldn't have C because C was already for competence, so W slash 1. And following the examination instructions in SMS W2. Several examination checklists are provided for the various frequency of examination. SMS W3, 4 and 5, the 14 days in use exam, the annual exam and the 10 year exam. And one day we might have a workshop on carriage and wagon maintenance. Don't be alarmed that this 14 days in use could be spread over 10 years. It's 14 days in use or 90 calendar days. 
The results of these inspections is reduced to a binary decision on the vehicle's fitness to run, which is recorded in the asset management system on hops. Does that sound familiar? Yes, just like a competence decision will be binary and then we'll record the person's fitness to work, let's say. Defects are reported on logbook sheets SMSW6. On-track plant maintenance, on-track plant in operational use is regularly maintained and serviced in accordance with the OTP maintenance policy SMS OTP1. Electrical appliances will be pat tested according to SMS slash Z slash 10. External work. The engineering business unit undertakes some, ex some work for external companies. How is this managed, he says. Well, I haven't really got any template answer for you there. Um, but you will have to have some way in which the risks arising from the work that you're going to do for external companies is going to be managed. Additional specifications and quality assurance applies to the engineering business unit activity undertaken for external companies and certain processes are subject to external quality control scrutiny. Uh, right, Thomas just asked a question about, I don't know how we will get round, get round, we don't get round things, how we will get round the locomotive maintenance section. Most, if not all, steam locos are private owned and ran by the drivers, so they are responsible for their own maintenance. Tom comes from a miniature railway, I should add. Uh, well, Tom, that may very well be the case in practice, but the company is responsible for the risks arising from those activities, from the use of that machinery and equipment, if it's on your site, and from the passengers who travel on those trains. And it will be no defence for you if, let's say, a train derails because it wasn't maintained properly, miniature train derails because it wasn't maintained properly, and a member of the public is injured. You will be required to demonstrate how you were managing the risk arising from the maintenance of that piece of equipment. And if you can't, then you're in the wrong, um, because it's your risk. So I'm sorry that's probably not the answer you wanted, and I know it's not what happens in practice, but I think, just to perhaps give you something more positive to work with, is that the risks arising from a miniature railway, significant though they are, are less than the risks arising from a standard gauge steam locomotive. And I'm sure that you will have some requirements for locomotive owners in how they uh, manage and maintain their locomotives and how they drive them when they're on your site with your members of the public. And number one is I imagine they probably have to have a boiler certificate. Um, and number two is I imagine they have to have two ways of putting water into the boiler and two safety valves and at least one gauge glass and all those sorts of things. And those are definitely mitigation measures that you can put in place and insist on um, to allow people to run their private locomotives. And perhaps some of the rest of the risk is necessary for you to absorb in order to run the railway that you want to run because no heritage railway is without unresolvable risk, unfortunately. Um, but yes, no matter what size the locomotive is, if it's being run on your track with your public, uh, especially if they're paying, uh, then you're responsible uh, and you can't get away from it. Uh, right, where are we? Part 8, designated workshops. There are numerous workshops on the company's sites. The locations of workshops is shown in SMS slash O slash 1, and most railways have one big engineering locomotive workshop, and then almost every tiny little subgroup, station group, gardening group has a container with a pillar drill and a bandsaw and a... Uh, sander and other things in it. Well, they're all workshops. Just because they're small and hidden away does not mean that they don't give rise to pretty significant risks. So they all count as workshops. Each workshop has a named responsible person who is responsible for the health and safety of the workshop and the persons working in it. So particularly in the case of station and gardening groups, it'll be generally the leader of the station department, which is, of course, appointed by uh, the manager of the department or the manager of the business unit, not elected locally by their friends. Um, who is responsible for the health and safety of the workshop and the persons working in it. The person's name is prominently posted in each workshop. Each workshop has a set of workshop instructions, similar to the station operations manual, containing the information shown in SMS02. SMS the work instructions contain a list of the tools and machines in the workshop that require specific competence to operate, agreed by the manager of the business unit. The responsible person in each workshop is responsible for maintaining the list of authorised users of the equipment they're in in HOPS, and ensuring that the relevant training has been carried out and documented. The names of the persons competent to operate such machinery are available to those with a requirement to know in hops, and obviously they will be chased up by the manager of the business unit who has the responsibility for making sure that this actually takes place. Um, a few months ago, maybe more, 
Um, the Kent and East Sussex Railway very maturely, and they're to be commended for this, published uh, their report into a workshop accident where a person um, nearly got dragged into a lathe where their, I think their cuff got caught on the lathe and they had some broken bones. This was circulated to Hops Railways via the Hop Safety Circular system. If you're not on the Hop Safety Circular, then you need to be on there. Ask your Hops admin to give you the permissions to receive safety circulars, which are where lessons are learned on one railway and you can anonymously share them with other railways. The reason I suddenly started talking about that is to underline the point that workshop equipment is very dangerous and the risks arising, most importantly, are injury to people but also damage to the railway's viability as a company if people are going to injure themselves in workshops that aren't properly managed. It's very easy to underestimate how dangerous a workshop can be, even if it's a small one with just a pillar drill or a lathe in it. Um, and it would be very unfortunate if any of us were landed um, with significant penalties because we weren't properly managing how these micro workshops were managed and the competence of staff uh, to operate the machinery. Uh, lists will also be kept in the workshop instruction of other tools and equipment that require routine inspection and maintenance and records of these inspections and maintenance shall be kept in hops in the asset management system. Engineering work on the company's assets is normally undertaken by internally trained staff. Where contractors are used, they can only work under the supervision of suitably qualified company staff. All such work is authorised in advance by the manager of the business unit and where required under the rulebook undertaken during possession times. Where required by the rulebook. Right, part H, getting towards the end now. Other people on the premises. Part 1, the public. The safety of members of the public remains paramount at all times. Risk assessments are conducted on public areas to identify and mitigate hazards that may affect the public. Most public areas are supervised by the company staff when open. Clear demarcation exists to limit areas of public access. Locomotive owning groups. Staff of locomotive owning groups are treated by this company in the same way as its own working staff in terms of competence and safety. A written agreement with each locomotive owning group based on the railway will be made that requires owning group staff to adhere to company rules and procedures. This also includes non-operational staff. And I've lost count of the number of times I've been at railways and seen just people wandering around all over the track, not really knowing where they're going, not having the proper clothing on, and the railway just says, oh, they don't work for us, they work for such and such a loco. Well, argh, it's still your responsibility, and you need to make sure that just because these people don't work for you, um, and they're on somebody else's public liability insurance, that you are still the duty holder, and you're making sure that they're following the rules that apply to the railway, not to just the company. The agreement will also detail the obligations and expectations of each side in terms of maintenance and running time and days. Obviously, there is a whole raft of workshops to be had on the business and commercial side of uh, locomotive owning group agreements but we were just concerned there with the safety components. Visitors to the railway shall be treated as members of the public. If they are required to go into non-public areas or onto the track side then special arrangements shall be made according to the circumstances and agreed with the manager of the business unit. Film crews that sort of thing. Um, initially they're just members of the public and they stay in the public areas and then you know that the uh, the relatively safer sort of arrangements apply, but if they are required to go into the non-public areas, then you will make special arrangements. There's a section in red. We've resurrected the old red here. Other examples of other people on the company's property, such as shared access to attractions, model or miniature railway, public transport on site, public footpaths, etc., etc. Lineside photographers. Pretty much everywhere now, as far as I'm aware, has withdrawn lineside photography permits. Lineside photography permits have been withdrawn. Only official company photographers who hold appropriate safety competence are authorised to access the lineside for the purpose of taking photographs. If you still allow uh, lineside photographers, then just write a paragraph there about how it's managed, possibly including reference to a sub-document if you're going to write more than a paragraph or so. Connections to other companies' infrastructure. The company, if you do, has a junction with Network Rail at such and such a location via a private siding. The siding is fully signalled in both directions. The line is shown in the Network Rail sectional appendix as a non-passenger line, but passenger trains occasionally operate over it in special arrangements. Obviously, this is all just made up. You will need to uh, change it so that it matches your circumstance. 
Moves over the connecting line are only made under special arrangements with the authority of the manager of the operations business unit. All three trains are either taken over for working on the whatever company by blah de blah company staff if they are familiar with the traction and rolling stock, or blah de blah company staff are provided as conductors. Rolling stock that has been accepted for transit on network rail lines is deemed fit for travel on our lines, provided it meets the weight and loading gauge restrictions applicable to the line. This will be checked with the TOC before any such movement is authorised. The manager of the operations business unit is responsible for ensuring or arranging a person to ensure that the train conforms to the agreed formation on arrival. So there's a bit of a risk that we're accepting, but I think we can justify it. We'll have said in loads of other documents that all rolling stock will be maintained, it will all be examined, it will all have a form, we'll all sign it, it will all be bulletproof. But if we're connected to Network Rail and we want to make the most of that connection, then we can't stop everything at the border and examine it. But it is, I believe, reasonable enough to say, if it's good enough for Network Rail, it's good enough to come onto our railway and run whatever train it's going to run, up for a maximum period of whatever you want to say, one day, two days, three days, whatever the maximum rate of possible deterioration is of the risk that you've identified before it falls into our maintenance regime. And we have to give it a seven-day exam and our staff for which we're responsible have to sign it off. If we turn that on its head and we talk about stuff on Heritage Railways going to Network Rail, we will have to admit that Network Rail is probably not likely to trust that just because it can run on a heritage railway, it can run on the main line. Whereas we sort of trust that if it can run on network rail, it can probably be good enough to within a reasonable degree of risk uh, to run on our line. And that is exactly true that for those of you who have network rail connections will know you can't just shove anything you want out onto the main line. You can only shove stuff out that's been properly inspected as fit to go on the main line. So it's not one of those things that works both ways. But I think it is justifiable to say that the mainline requirements are more strict than ours, apart from uh, loading gauge and axle weight, which is why it specifically mentions the things there. Um, and so if it's good enough to run on network rail, then it's good enough to run here for a short period of time until we can examine it. Uh, right, as far as reasonably practicable, the signalling and operating arrangements on our company mirror those on network rail whilst maintaining the context of our company to avoid unnecessary complexities crossing the boundary. So let's not have red for go and green for stop or anything silly like that. Let's, as far as we can, follow the historical prototype if we have a network rail connection or a connection to another company's infrastructure, private sidings or whatever it is, just to make life a little bit easier for everyone. Right, section J, emergencies. The company's response plan for emergencies is made up of the operations manual and the rule books and forms part of its overall business continuity planning covering incidents both on and off the railway. The operations manual and rule books describes how the safety of the railway, visitors and staff is handled, an appropriate response to any incident, liaison with the emergency services and reporting to regulatory authorities and incident investigation. Uh, no number of a sub-document there, which there probably should be, to at least one or more sub-documents that explain where this stuff's going to take place. The duty officer remains responsible for the railway in event of an emergency, although may delegate parts of their responsibility to other senior members of staff if required. A clear understanding delimiting the areas of responsibilities must be reached under one of the following three arrangements. A rail incident officer may be appointed by the duty officer, which will obviously have to have the required competence, to manage an incident site at ground level. The RIA will be appointed in accordance with the operations manual and the DO will remain in overall charge. Option two, a commercial deputy may be appointed by the duty officer in times of significant commercial disruption to take charge of the non-operational elements of the railway, such as dealing with the public and refunds and buses and taxis and all those sorts of things. Or option three, an assistant duty officer may be appointed to assist the duty officer in dealing with two geographically separate incidents or to assist in the running of the normal railway while the duty officer goes to a remote site. So one of those three permutations um, is how the roles and responsibilities could potentially be divided up if there was a significant incident. Uh, let's have a look. Um, so thank you very much uh, to Nathan, who has commented 
about the challenges with operating workshop machinery, whether you are employed or volunteer, there is no difference. And to understand PUA, the provision and use of work equipment regulations for their responsibilities and the company's responsibilities. Yes, absolutely right. And I think that conforms with what we've generally said throughout this workshop, that it doesn't make any difference at all whether you're employed or not employed. And also, which again, I'm not saying anything that uh, hasn't been made public, um, you can't just say that because somebody was a machinist for their entire working life that they can come and be a machinist on the railway. They will still have to go through the same assessment processes as everybody else. And if, they're, if they take pride in their skill, they shouldn't have a problem with doing that. If somebody comes in and says, oh, I already know how to do that and I'm not doing your assessment, then first of all, you can't comply with the SMS. And secondly, they don't have the right approach to safety management on the Heritage Railway that you want. Um, part three, emergency exercises. The railway occasionally holds emergency exercises. These take the form of mutual improvement classes that all staff are encouraged to attend to practice events for real. That's a sort of, you know, November or February type thing. Um, going out and splitting a train Buckeyes in the middle of nowhere or pretending that it's failed and assisting it with an assistant engine, all those sorts of things. Quite good fun, but also give people the opportunity to practice these events for real. Part four, degraded operations including weather. The operational rulebook caters for most degraded working scenarios such as obstructions of the line, infrastructure damage and block system failure. The duty officer will give guidance to the signalman on the most appropriate post-incident response. Injured or stranded passengers. Injured passengers are conveyed by train to the next available station. Ambulances may be called by the guard or other train crew to meet the train at the relevant station. There is no, ro for example, there is no road access to bloody blah station. So casualties either have to be wheelchaired or stretchered to, in this case, where I stole this from, uh, the mainline station car park. Let's colour that in red so that you, uh, there we go. Um... Oh, well, in fact, you can see where I got this from. Let's just delete some of this. Mm -hmm. la, la, la. There we go. Or the air ambulance summoned. Uh, obviously, if that doesn't apply to you, delete the sentence. Or if different arrangements apply to you about potential emergency access and which stations are good for summoning ambulances to and which ones aren't, uh, then you can adjust it. I went to... Um, uh, a railway not so long ago, and they had an excellent procedure for um, emergencies, particularly injured people, and it was called the drop-and-go procedure, which I thought was quite a good name, and they had a radio system, and if they announced on the radio that it was a, like a drop-and-go incident because they needed um, immediate assistance, and they would describe on the radio call what assistance they needed... And it was a requirement. If they needed a first aider in a particular area, that if you were a first aider, you dropped what you were doing and you went. And if a person had fallen into a river and you were a long pole reach rescue qualified person, that you dropped what you were doing and you went. And I thought that was a really good way of clearly and quickly summoning assistance in an emergency. Uh, right, where were we? So the stranded trains policy applies, operations manual procedure five, to trains at a stand, not at a station. This minimises passenger discomfort and seeks to avoid any dehydration or undue stress to passengers. Parts of the policy involve the free distribution of drinks and the dissemination advice to passengers. This stranded trains thing is something that I've heard a lot of railways mention. They've been asked about um, in visits by the ORR. What's the stranded trains policy? So obviously that's something that's coming up the risk agenda. So you'd definitely be wise to have one. Failed trains, the company's rulebook deals with the operational the operational and operational oh operational and operational safety elements of the protection and recovery of failed trains. The stranded trains policy deals with the social and customer elements. The response to significant incidents such as derailment, spads, collisions and fatalities is guided by the railway's rulebook and operations manual. Thankfully we don't have too many of those. Fires, lineside fires, can be tackled by lances from steam locomotives if safe to do so and before they become out of control. Larger lineside fires have to be tackled via the fire brigade with railway assistance to access the property if required. Buildings are risk assessed for fire protection as a result of which some are fitted with fire alarms or fire suppressant systems. This is safety related, by the way, not necessarily protection of assets related. And I know some heritage centres have fire suppressant system for the protection of assets. We're concerned here about the protection of people. Fires on trains are extremely serious and the railway's emergency plan and rulebook deals with the actions required, SMS R1. Which leads us nicely onto the subject of accident reporting. 
We are on section 31 of 35, you'll be pleased to hear. Accidents involving people, staff and customers on the railway are reported immediately to the function supervisor and then subsequently on paper via an accident form, SMSZ12. The accident forms are located by the safety manager or whoever it is who you decide locate, uh, collates the accident forms and further action taken if required. I recommend at this stage having a near misses and incidents register on hops specifically for the receipt of accident forms. So that as soon as you get the paper form, you can put it in hops. And then even if the bit of paper gets lost, uh, you've still got the record in hops. It also enables you to identify the trends of what type of accidents are on the up and what are on the down. Slips and trips, always on the up. Any accidents that involve an operational element, such as if a rule or procedure has not been followed or an item of operational equipment is implicated, are passed to the manager of the operations business unit or the operations manager for operational investigation. In the event of failures, a breach of rules or other serious incidents, the manager of the business unit will conduct or direct a nominated person to conduct an internal inquiry. Internal inquiries shall have the objective of making safety improvement recommendations to prevent a reoccurrence. So that happens at the manager of the business unit level. In all cases, the manager of the business unit will obtain written reports of the incident from those concerned before compiling their own report. In the event of any dispute, the matter will be considered at a full board meeting if necessary, convened specially for the purpose. Obviously, that is a, a situation that would occur after a significant uh, incident, not just after one little thing. If there is any doubt as to how an incident investigation should be handled, the manager of the business unit will consult with one or more of the directors and, if necessary, the ORR or RAIB. Also, if the incident... If the incident were considered, it also, if the incident was considered beyond the experience of the current management, external assistance with the investigation would be sought. Yes, right, got it. If we don't feel that you have the technical knowledge internally to adequately investigate the incident, external assistance will be sought. Right, good. Operations Manual Procedure 1, SMS M21 deals with the railway's requirement for incident reporting to regulatory and accident investigation authorities. Full cooperation will be given to any independent assessment body required to act under regu the regulations. The manager of the business unit will normally be present for all such assessments and routine ORR, HMRI or RAI, well, HMRI doesn't exist anymore, um, RAIB or HSE visits and all work areas staff and volunteers will be available as appropriate. Uh, there have definitely been many incidents, both on the main line and on heritage railways, where they have not been reported within the timescales that they're supposed to be reported. So operations manual procedure number one um, uh, details that. Health and safety is a standard item on the board meeting agenda, as we said earlier, and the board is appraised of any accidents or incidents that may have occurred. The board receives the HASCOM minutes. Results of investigations will always be recorded and reported to the general manager to ensure actions are taken as appropriate to prevent a reoccurrence. Okay, accidents to staff, that's what all that was. Near misses and dangerous occurrences. Staff are encouraged to report near misses via the near miss reporting system, which all staff have access to electronically via hops. Near misses are looked into by <laughs> looked into are looked into by the safety manager or other senior manager and actions taken where appropriate. The near miss policy refers SMS slash Z slash nine B. Section L staff consultation. Staff consultation is inherently difficult due to the nature of the workforce, i.e. a very large workforce that are often keen to only participate directly in their hobby rather than ancillary activities perceived as less interesting. Ooh, controversial. But probably true. A weekly email is sent to all volunteers when the one is issued. Cover email saying, please find attached the one. Here's what's been going on this week. Here is any safety information. Is a really good thing for maintaining good open, approachable communication between them and us. Um, obviously, if you do it fortnightly, do it fortnightly, but use that as an opportunity to communicate with people and uh, encourage people to take an interest in what's going on, even if it's not directly related to the work that they do. Uh, this contains special notices on a mutual improvement theme. If significant announcements are made, such as a significant commercial event or a change of senior staff, a separate informal note is distributed to the booking on points and key staff and notice boards on the railway. The board of the company produces an occasional newsletter containing non-confidential summary of recent board discussions and actions. 
These are all just examples of things that you can do to improve and demonstrate that you're taking part in staff consultation, which is a requirement for um, good health and safety management in the company. Communications meetings, or whatever you want to call them, are held once or twice a year, which are open meetings which all staff can attend. Senior managers generally give a presentation of recent railway events and activities and discussion from staff is encouraged, a bit like Prime Minister's questions. Departments are also encouraged to maintain regular informal communication, i.e. by email, with their department members, and this is well received. HASCOM has a f- is a formal committee for raising and resolving safety issues. Any member of staff can raise a health and safety issue to be discussed at HASCOM. Staff are encouraged at all times to communicate with their managers and with the department safety rep on any health and safety matter, including the safety management system. As the railway is a relatively small undertaking, if you are, uh, general communication and consultation takes place regularly as the manager of the business unit visits most locations frequently and just talks to people. Directors also visit on a regular basis and many take part in the actual operation on roster duties or make unannounced visits to many work locations. So make of all that what you will, all examples of ways in which you can say, yes, we are consulting with staff. The SMS and other safety and policy documents are made available to all staff via HOPS, of course. Hard copies are kept in such and such a location and are available on request. Complaints. Visitor complaints are dealt with by the commercial office department and any relating to safety are passed to the manager of the business unit for action. Uh, The manager of the business unit deals with all operational staff disciplinary matters which are handled using the disciplinary and grievance procedure HOPS HRP, so not SMS, HRP 05. This includes an appeals process. Just before we go any further, I'm just reading a comment in the questions uh, from Tom. About wands and ponds, looking on hops, is there no way to say that a notification has been issued or am I missing something? When you upload a document to hops, Tom, there is a button there to say send email and then all the people with whatever the relevant permission number is uh, will get an email saying here's a new document for you. And that is good, I would say, for things that don't require a cover note. Things like um, working timetable or I don't know. I would recommend instead, when you come to doing the one or the pon, instead of using that tick box in the HOPS document uploading thing, that you upload it, copy the link, and then send an email or a HOPS comms message and put the link in it yourself, because it gives you the option to write a couple of paragraphs of discussion around what you're sending and why you're sending it, rather than just people going, new document, link. At least then they can receive... Hi everyone, we've reviewed this in light of that, we've made this change, here's a summary, please have a read, let us know if you've got any questions, it's all a bit more approachable. Number three, absence management in the case of the majority of staff attendance is optional, although rostered agreements to work are expected to be honoured, apart from the maintenance of competence which is dealt with separately, if a volunteer member of staff declines to volunteer for a period there is no issue. Staff who consistently fail to report for duty will be dealt with by the manager of the business unit in the disciplinary policy HRP 05. Employed members of staff are required to attend at the advertised time and failure to do so will be dealt with by the manager of the business unit under the disciplinary policy. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this stuff about HR and disciplinary policy does not have to be in the SMS. But if you have a really good SMS, and I don't mean necessarily that it's good in the words, I mean it's good in the structure and it's good in how the SMS is managed you will run a strong operation and a strong railway. So for the sake of an extra page in the SMS referring to these HR documents, it helps strengthen those HR documents as well. And there aren't a huge number of them, and I don't think it diminishes the rest of the SMS overall documents. So that's why I chose to have them in the um, uh, in the SMS overall documents. Of course, um, it may be necessary for these HR documents, particularly the disciplinary policy, to overlap with some safety aspects of the company. If a person does something wrong and is told not to do it again and then does it again, then that is either a training issue or a discipline issue. And if it's a discipline issue, then suddenly the disciplinary policy has a role to say, uh, a role to play uh, in safety management. Employed members of, oh, I've read that, performance policy, where performance of an individual member of staff is not of the required standard. Oh, this is what I've just said. This will be dealt with by the department manager in the first instance and the railway and the manager of the 
business unit in the second, with a view to ascertaining what support and or training the individual needs to reach the required standard. If, after this support and or training is given, the individual still fails to meet the required standard, the manager of the business unit will determine an appropriate way forward and whether it is appropriate for that member of staff... Whoops. Oh, dear. I can't type and look at the same time. ...to remain in that role. And it shouldn't make any difference whether it's an employed or volunteer member of staff in this case. Obviously, the next step will be different based on whether it's an uh, employee or a member of staff, but if a person's work is not to the required standard, then it's not to the required standard. The grievance policy is detailed in HRP 04. The appeals policy for disciplinary issues is detailed in the disciplinary policy and for grievance issued is in the grievance procedure. And finally, I think it's finally. Uh, yep, it is finally, so cling on if you can for another 30 seconds. Review and audit of the SMS. Continuous improvement of the SMS will be a permanent aspiration of the company. Through the establishment of the Health and Safety Committee, commitment of personnel from all levels, through monitoring the systems, internal safety audits, and learning the lessons from incidents, accidents, and in particular near misses should they occur. The safety management system is a dynamic document which will be developed to reflect enhancements of safety practices. Continuous improvement of the SMS is achieved by learning from internal investigations into incidents, feedback from staff, engaging external advisors and consultants, study of the HRA guidelines, attending HRA meetings where safety is discussed with peer groups where there are exchange of best practices, regular review of RAIB reports, I recommend that you read them all, even the mainline ones, because there's always lessons to be learned, and ORR documents from across the railway industry, and participation, of course, in the HOPS SMS best practice workshops. The SMS will be reviewed whenever material changes are made to the key description of the operation shown herein, or other significant changes of operation, infrastructure, or context. The maximum interval between reviews of any SMS document is five years. The review will be undertaken by one or more of the following representatives, the manager of the business unit, an operations representative, a workshop representative, a safety advisor, department staff rep, safety rep, sorry. And of course, depending on what the nature of the document is that's being reviewed will depend which of those that you pick. The SMS shall be periodically reviewed by an external person with experience of railway management. This person shall be requested to critique the SMS and suggest any areas for improvement. The person would ideally have experience of SMS handling from another heritage railway. At least once per year, an aspect of the SMS determined by the general manager shall be audited. The general manager shall appoint a person to conduct the audit and provide them with a written remit. The auditor shall meet with the department or individual responsible for the element of the SMS review, uh, sorry, and review the compliance and evidence. A brief report should be made to the general manager commenting on the level of compliance. And this isn't about witch-hunting people that aren't doing their job. This is about identifying for everybody's benefit where the SMS is being complied with and where it isn't, and then providing support where it isn't being complied with so that it is. And I think as long as you start with that, with saying no one's going to lose their job over this, this is about provide, uh, or finding... Um, places where we're not compliant so that we can help everybody be compliant then hopefully it will be received uh, in the manner it's intended. Version control of this safety management system is maintained by the SMS document manager or document controller whatever you want to call it to ensure changes are clearly identified and revisions and communications to all copy holders or are communicated to all copy holders. Minor revisions are indicated by a vertical line in the margin major revisions by a complete reissue. Version control of the operating rulebook, which is one of the key supporting documents for this safety management system, is maintained by the operating department to ensure changes are clearly identified and revisions are communicated to all copy holders. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. You've reached the end of the SMS overall document, which I think you'll agree, in most cases, said pretty much nothing at all apart from pointing you to the place where you can find the actual answer for the thing that you're looking for. And if you think that's what it did do, then good, because that's exactly what I aimed for it to do. As I said right at the start, some organisations have a massive SMS overall document that's much more than an overall document and very few supporting documents. 
I always like to go for the keeping the overall document as relatively small as we possibly can and having loads of little supporting documents uh, to, uh, to give the detail. So thank you very much indeed for tuning in to HOPS SMS workshop number 21 on the overall document of safety management systems. Now's your last 10 seconds or so to raise any comments or queries that you want to. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Wayne for your comments. And yes, I will try and get the templates out as soon as I can. I always do get a couple of days of more feedback from people emailing in or sending me messages or whatever after these workshops. So I do like to leave it a couple of days. Um, at least before publishing the templates, just to give that last opportunity for best practice to be uh, included. But I will do it as soon as I can. Thanks very much, everyone, for tuning in. The next HOPS SMS Live workshop is on Tuesday, the 18th of January, where we'll be discussing the competence for duty officers, or whatever it is you want to call them. Apart from that, I hope you all have great success in your Christmas operations, and I hope they bring you the um, enjoyment and happiness that you... Um, uh, sorry, I'm just reading these comments. Thank you very much, everyone, for your comments. I hope the Christmas operations bring you the success that you want and the exposure that you want for your railway and, if we're honest, the financial income uh, that we all rely on for Christmas. So I hope you have all have a good Christmas. Keep in touch with Hops. We'll see you all in the new year. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in, and good night. Good night.